Happy Friday? Happy Friday? Happy Friday, everybody. We're doing weird things on a Friday. It's January 20th, 2023. Does it feel weird enough for you that here we are on a Friday? I'm weird fri Friday the, the 20th. Food. That's right. That's it. Hey, guessing game. What, what exotic food am I eating? Samosas. Wrong. Now it's bow. Damn. Oh, I, sh I could have guessed that. I saw the bow in his thing earlier, too. Damn. I'll let you walk into that one. Hello, everybody. We're going to do some weird things podcast hey. here in a little bit. Thank you for, for joining us. Bow eaters on a Friday. Bow eaters. More bow, than bow. eats the bow. Chica -chica. <laughs> there's, there's got, do you think that there's one or 1,000 restaurants called Day Bow Bow? If I Google Day Bow Bow. One, I mean, if not zero, I feel like it's your destiny. You're thinking zero, okay. Yeah. What is it? Day Bow. How about Take a Bow? Probably a million of those. Well, that's just, now we're just doing Bob's Burger jokes. Uh, get ready for all the bow. There's bowed up. Never watched an episode, so bow, bow. shove it. Bow bow bon me, bow day. Wow. Uh, day bow bow. I feel like this is your ghost kitchen. Yeah. You just cook it in your cook it in your in your apartment and sell it on Uber Eats. Yep. Day bow bow. All we, of the people offered, who ha get the '80s reference. Yeah. We offer two types of of pork buns. Uh, the sun, which is beautiful, and that's pork. I feel like I should have. I feel like I should have beautiful. a silly hat with this jacket. Like I should have one of them them hats that like that kind of like comes out. Oh, like a Kangol hat. Yeah, yeah, but not but turned the other way, so I look like a like I I should be shining shoes or I'm like a, a British detective. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, you would be good with like a, a Sherlock Holmes hat. One yeah. of those hunting caps. A little uh, conehead hat. stalker. Yeah. That's he, he, Justin told these guys can wear anything and make it work. Um, I don't like, know. I, I mean, this is a ridiculous jacket, but, uh, then there's a, uh, a Sonoran toad, uh, uh tie dye t-shirt that was a promo for Mike Tyson's weed in Las Vegas that, uh, Mitzi <laughs> gave to me. That's, amazing. uh, uh, the last time that I was out there, or two times ago that I was out, out there in Vegas. Uh, speaking I guess of if jackets, you were like in a, let's say if he was in a fancy suit, I'd be like, oh, he's really trying to impress his Russian billionaire father. Yeah. To take over the empire. Yeah. So uh, I made the mistake of uh, sending Bonnie just a random article titled, What's That Cool Jacket Joel from The Last of Us is Wearing? Uh, not remembering that the it was within. 48 hours of the mistake birthday. the mistake oh no you accidentally did it on your birthday oh geez anyway it arrives tomorrow yeah of course it does <laughs> yeah no it just, just you know you can just say I, I think the jacket looks cool as hell and i'm glad i i'm glad my wife got it for my birthday yeah hi everybody uh that was a great cut scene it was a great 90 minute cut scene the whole show yeah yeah well, I know it wasn't a cutscene. It was all action. It was all quests. I wish there were more cutscenes. That that should be my my review. I wish there were more cutscenes, and it wasn't just all inventory building and going from point A to B. I mean, it's almost like honest, they had to set up a story. They no, but did they? Uh, did they yeah. set up a story? They did. Did they? Yeah. Well, I don't like I a mean, lot of gathering they, uh, wrenches they, and they knives, so they can go from point a, a to quest. point B. It's like, like here's your primary quest. Here are side quests. Okay, so, yeah. we're, we're we're side questing here. Okay, all right. Let's not do that. Uh, all right, Andrew, you ready to do a show? <laughs> yeah, I just want to say I love Bryce the Taskmaster because it's like I just love like all right, guys, all right, idiots, shut up. Well, and you guys just accept it. Especially, well, because here's the problem is that Bryce actually has to spend time with Brian and I, and Brian and I, left unchecked, will just they will go for jammer yep. for uh, I know, a million I know, years. I know, and I, I like that Bryce, you feel comfortable enough to be like, hey, uh, I know your name's be above the marquee here, but you are chimpanzees, no, he's the coach. and I have the hug. <laughs> he, he's the yeah. coach on this one. Brian and I both know that we're yeah. dabbling. Yes, man. Don't give me my whistle. No one's going to like that. All right, let's do a podcast Blow here. the whistle. <laughs> doot, doot, doot. Choo choo, choo choo. All right, recording over there, recording over there. All right, Andrew, I'll catch you in for the Weird Things podcast. In three, two. 
Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Mr. Justin Roberts Young. Well, hello, friends. Brian Brushwood. You know what I respect is our commitment to showing up every single week. <laughs> yeah. Well, the glue that keeps us all together, Mr. Bryce Castillo. I am the I'm glue. Bryce glue Castillo. I am glue. <laughs> Bryce the glue in this cheap particle board. <laughs> oh, this is a nice particle board. They put glue in it. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah. The glue is the best part, you know. I love that glue up. could have been working with graphite composites. It could have been holding much better materials together, but you left with this sawdust here. Ask any preschooler. Uh, the glue, the paste, it's the best part. Yeah, they love it. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen. Again? Uh, what a, what a slow last couple months for technology. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I was really, do, do, I was really looking forward to my Christmas vacation and chilling out in December and just knowing that the pace of things was this nice, even predictable run and how relaxing it's all been. How about this? You say as much as you want to say, and all of us respect the fact that we're not allowed to press you into saying anything. Can you describe <laughs> for us what the last month looks like for you? Because uh, just before we went live, I mentioned that we're in a curious position because we were a fan cast for a team, and then one of our members joined the team, and then the team became the most important thing on the planet. <laughs> like... Uh, uh, you drive. None of us want to mess this anything up for you. Okay, so full disclosure here, for those of you who don't know, uh, and besides doing this podcast, which is my primary vocation, by the way, and way of supporting myself, so please consider supporting us <laughs> Patreon. Um, uh, I work for a company called open ai you might have heard of them has a thing called chat gpt right now um and there's the video i produced <laughs> there uh so i i i think i mentioned i work for open ai right now and a year ago i took on i was doing i was working on the engineering side and the applied side and then a year ago i took a job on the comms team. Comms team handles messaging and PR and communications, a lot of other things, which I was excited to do because I love to talk. So I am the science communicator for OpenAI, which means I get to help a lot with how we how we try to explain stuff. Like right before this podcast, I was giving a briefing to a journalist about a technology they wanted to know, like, hey, can you explain more about how this works? And so that's what I do is I go in and do that. And, and it's amazing kids, like making, bluffing your way through a podcast like this puts you in a position where, you know, you get paid to bluff. Oh, yeah, it's this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to understand. You know, let me just, I'll use marshmallows as an example so I don't have to throw all the scientific terminology at you, which I know really well. Um, but it's, it's, it's we, roughly we have, the equivalent of the way uh, uh, Larry King would say, uh, I never read the books of the people I interview because I want to approach them as an average man would, somebody who hasn't read their book. <laughs> yeah, like my... I'm going to, here's my job. I work for a company filled with really brilliant people who are super kind and generous with their, with their time. And so somebody says, Hey, how would you explain this? So I go to world's leading expert and say, Hey, how would you explain this? <laughs> and then they tell me, and then I go back to that person and I say what that other person told me and they go, wow, you're really good at this. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> because I looked up the answers before I said anything. Yeah, now I that's asked, I asked the expert. Now I, that's yeah. cheating, Andrew. It Learning sounds, the answers sounds like yeah, I, sounds I like a everybody. sweet game. I, tell, I am very open. I tell everybody this is what I do. I, I'm like, oh, I'm like, but like, yeah, it means I get to spend a lot of time with different areas of research and, and paying attention to what they're doing and asking really dumb questions. Um, and so it's a very it's a, it's an awesome it's an awesome awesome place to be. It's a very exciting place to be. We had. Uh, we had a very busy year. We had a very busy year. We had Dolly, which is our image generation system. Uh, you know, we had, you know, uh, Codex, our code system, which came out, which was super capable. We had Whisper, which is our speech to text system. We put out three, GPT 3.5, which earlier in the year, I did a blog post showing how you could use natural language to create games like Wordle and all this. So a lot of really, really cool stuff. And then, uh, 
we were like, okay, you know, we're, we're curious to see how people could interact with an AI using like a, a chat like interface. We wanted to get some data of that. So our researchers were like, hey, we want to collect data to see how people would interact with that. So let's take this model that's been out for you know, like nine months, 3.5, and we've trained it on top to be better at answering questions like this. And we're just going to let people use it and see that. And, and you know, like, okay, cool. How many people think we'll use it? Okay, I know a few, you know, it's, it's an AI thing. It's a nerdy thing, whatever. Like, okay, cool. You know, we're going to be you know having kind of a quiet period, whatever. So this is perfect timing holidays. Nobody's going to be paying attention. And then, you know, chat GPT and you're getting headlines like on Axios, chat GPT, the talk of Davos. Uh, it, it, it went, uh, 17 year old kids at the ice cream shop excitedly telling me about how they're using this. Like it is just, it has been insane. Uh, uh I, I had, I had, I had, I had a, a fun conversation with our friend, uh, Darren kitchen of hack five, who is AI obsessed. Like he, he was, he was telling me that, that he has not been as excited for a technology since, you know, the, 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 the smartphone kind of revolution that happened back in the, the, the aughts and the tens. But he's thinking about a new show about uh, uh, payloads, and he asked ChatGPT to write a script for a show that would go over Hack 5 payloads, and it writes a great script. And then he's like, okay, well, how about I have it talk about this specific payload and just puts a URL for the payload of it, and because ChatGPT understands DuckyScript, which is what it's written in, it does a natural language explanation of exactly what that script does. Wow. It, it, it was it was exceptional. The, the the stuff that he was showing me, it's like you could, you know, with 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 Fiverr, at, you know, you could you could find on camera talent and and feed them this. And I don't know if he he wouldn't do that because that's not his brand, but he could if he wanted to. It is exceptional. I, I've even used it a little bit for some of the games mm. on on Great Night recently, just as a way to generate just quick trivia questions or easy. <laughs> I yeah, I've I've used it for uh, uh, show notes. I hate writing show notes for a podcast. After I'm done producing a podcast, oh. I just I'm like tired of it, and so uh, uh, I can have it summarize my um my the actual notes I used for the show. I can just summarize it it's not that it's a contest but i used it to give me a bunch of questions that would be interesting to ask william shatner live on stage i wouldn't have admitted to that one <laughs> i would have probably had hung that hat on my head <laughs> no i think it's cool uh what is what is interesting and the thing that we want people to understand is this model is really cool can do a lot of things but there are limitations and and if you had asked me two months ago like what were important things I'd want to teach people. One is the idea of how to talk to machines. That's e even my sub stack has been called how to talk to machines. Cause that's what we get into from using things like Dolly and other image generators to talking to here. If you said, what would I love people to learn in the next couple of years? Like one, how to talk to machines. <clears throat> Two, to understand that what the concept of safety and alignment, the idea that you're going to, you're going to, they're going to try to behave in a way that doesn't keep you from doing things that, you know, maybe, it shouldn't do out of the box, but that's a discussion about where those lines should be. That's that's really a discussion where it is, right? What people understand that, and they, these models can hallucinate. They can make stuff up. They can tell you things that yeah. it's true, that's not true, and that people should use them with an appropriate amount of skepticism. Use them with use them when they're capable, but but don't believe everything they say. If you, I said oh, I can imagine maybe in a few years, in six weeks, like everybody gets that now, and, yeah. and like I I got hired. I was one of the reasons I was hired originally was to be a prompt writer, was to be a person who was writing prompts internally to take, figure out how to talk to chat, to talk to GPT-3. I wrote a lot of the examples and a lot of the documentation for that. And I was the internal prompt whisperer at OpenAI, which was this arcane art of understanding the capabilities of a model and getting it to perform things like this. How to invoke it to do this thing? And then we came up with these instruction following models, which were better. They were the ones trained to sort of understand what a person wants. And then you get to chat GPT and guess what? Everybody is a prompt writer now. Everybody yeah. is a prompt whisperer. I, I talked to, I was in an event where I talked to some people who run a big YouTube channel. And this guy's like, yeah, he says, I may hire just a prompt writer just to solve problems within my company, looking at how to use chat GPT or one of the other systems you know, by doing that. And that was kind of a very interesting thing to think about because you can be a prompt writer 
or you can be a person that works with chat GPT and has no idea how it works underneath it and, but still do really good work. I think it has, it has unlocked and demonstrated something that, uh, uh, you know, we have long talked about on this show, which is AI going from something that is magic and then and therefore people have magic expectations for it and often fears, and not to say that there aren't very, very legitimate fears about AI, but if it's a technology, now all of a sudden you have turned a corner with the populace. And I think that is really what I've seen with ChatGPT is that this is no longer a, a a crazy incantation that may or may not turn us all into frogs. This is something for which has real world applications and real world limitations. And I think it has created, thankfully, a, a, a far more robust and interesting discourse about this than I think uh, what was surrounding AI before, which was, you know, somewhere between uh uh you know, a cyberdyne and it, it was uh, all theoretical uh, utopia, you know, hyperbole before. And, and now all of a sudden it's a practical thing that any of us can interact with and recognize the limitations of. And yeah, and but in, in, in the same way that like the internet before it's like, so what I can, I can find out a, a sports score. I can do that at the newspaper. Right. right. It's like, no, no, the internet is a fundamentally, uh, uh, re society reshaping tool. I, I, I suspect AI somewhere uh, 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 south of that, whether it's just south or north of it, who knows? I, we are at it, such, such an early point, you know, the, the, it's such an early point in the evolution of this. And the thing I want to reiterate too, is that this was a research preview. This was not a product. It was the time we launched, it was not a product. Literally it was the research team wanted to do this. We're like, yeah, it sounds cool. And clearly did not predict the adoption and the the crazy amount of attention it's getting. You know, we had a first week and we're like, okay, this will blow over. And then it blew up and blew up because now people are paying attention to AI and the acceleration is only going to continue between us and other people and what's going on. Can, can I speculate as to how that came to pass? Uh, this is normally the stuff we would talk about in after talk, but... I suspect that uh, because you're you're 100 correct in that everything that's there was always there, but as as somebody who has interfaced as a beta user of the technology, there were layers that you had to puncture one layer, log in mm -hmm. layer, 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 uh, and instead uh, by reducing quite simply the number of clicks it took to access the thing. Um, that that was the actuating event, uh, it, it, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred. It is. We we looked at like because we did no wait list, no cost. Uh, anybody could go up and use it. You know that 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 getting rid of all that bit of friction where, <clears throat> you know, gauging because we've had our, you know anybody can use our playground and get free credits. You get eighteen dollars of credits to use that. Anybody can do that, and we see a lot of people using that. But there is a certain number of steps, but. But we saw this excitement, but it was really hard for us, particularly because one, it was the raw capability in that 3.5 model, like I said, had been around for, for the better part of a year. And it, it, it was an example of like, we, you know, Brian, you and I talk a lot about like how, when we give people advice, like you mentioned, we do this often in our after thing shows, like get rid of the friction. Like what you think is a minor bump can be a huge bump to people. And you don't know how many people just decided not to. And we got rid of all the friction just to make it simple. And then that made this, you started to see, boom, all the text pop up on Twitter and all this happened. And that, that I think that's, you know, we, we, we numbers we've talked about, like, you know, we went to a million users in like the first few days, which set some sort of record for tech adoption. And that shows you what can happen if you have something that's exciting and you can get rid of the friction. The challenge we've had, of course, is research preview. It's not like... We had tons of server farms just set aside to provide, you know. Uh, you you guys, the, I, had... I suspect, would have to hustle to provide the horsepower to make everything continue to happen. Anybody walks in the building, we frisk them for GPUs. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah you can use these, you know. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, that, just, just, uh, hold just... them up by their feet, shake out the GPUs when you hold them upside down. Yeah, and I, I want to give a shout out to we have amazing researchers here 
And as you've seen by the quality, what this has been able to do, that even at this stage, that this is this usable and this is that this, that people are able to integrate this workflow is amazing. Our engineers that have had to meet with this capacity, meet with this demand. These people have been doing incredible work, our product managers and the people who've been just doing this. Um, it disrupted like holiday plans for many people, way more than for me and people who just, just but they, they love what they're trying to do. They're excited about making this available. They see this, the excitement of seeing somebody do something cool. You read a story about somebody who has uh, dyslexia, who's able to use it to help write a, write a story or write a letter. We had an example of this Korean woman was able to write holiday cards in English for all of her family members doing this. Like you get these examples of just you go, holy cow, like you just, you knew this capability was out there, but when people discover this for themselves, I talked to a student at Stanford who's from another country and he's been using this to help him write his essays and craft, not to write them for them, but to help him take his, his native language, which he can understand and translate to another language and communicate better. And he feels like he can talk to people now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think when we were talking about Dolly sometime last year, um, I I had a similar feeling about that of like, uh, you know, it, you could use something like that to help you imagine things, to picture things, to to visualize things, um, especially if maybe you uh, have have like a Fantasia or or some sort of processing image recognition uh, issue. And or, and I think or, ChatGPT or if you're opens seeking that up. an appropriate metaphor for an idea that you're trying to put words to, you can. Mm. Type it out and then see what Dolly comes up with, and maybe it lands, maybe it doesn't. I, I, I like to I call find, finding that metaphor bri <laughs> I did. I did a talk for some YouTubers, and I was explaining how you could use Dolly to prototype thumbnails. And in the middle of the talk, one guy was furiously typing away on his phone, talking to somebody, explaining what I'm talking about. People taking photos of my slides, and then right after the talk, he came up and he showed me the thumbnail that he had him, the person generate as a background because he had a trouble because he. He shot in some location where everybody used the same image and he needed a different image and he used the dolly to go do that. And it was just crazy to see that adoption rate. Um, it's it's funny, like Ledwin in the, in the chat mentioned says, should have you should have asked it what would happen. And you know, it's meaning that we're trying to figure out like, how would you predict what's gonna happen with chat GPT? It's like, maybe you should have asked it. And that's a, it's a very fair point. And that's one of the things that, we are trying internally to integrate this into our workflow. I use I use this tool and our other tools all daily, daily, hourly to sort of do stuff and do things like that. Um, but it's all too often that you do, you work your way through something like, man, I probably could have got the AI to do that for me quicker. And I had you guys mentioned bullet points and things like that. Yeah, I have to write summaries and other stuff. A lot of these things like that and. Now it's just my default. I just throw a bunch of data at that and get it and go like, is this good? Cool. Moving on. So, uh, yeah, we should have I, I, asked. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're not allowed to explore this area. So feel free to divert me. But um, as an outsider, I feel like um, uh, OpenAI has done ex an extraordinary job of slow rolling. Like, yes, Chat GPT became very, very famous very quickly partly because uh, there were fewer hurdles to get to it. But I also feel like OpenAI has done a tremendous job of properly calibrating expectations when it comes to it. Um, uh, to the extent that you're able to, how much can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, our, 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 we have a <laughs> man with job says nice things about people who gave him job. Right. Uh, well, and and, and that, more news. that's why but, I don't want to push too hard because I know no, it, no, it's I'm a very delicate. I, I, I want to get to, like I'm, I'm at this company because I really like the values of, of the people there. It's a place where you can be heard. Um, I, you can go to openai.com. You can see there's a video. I, I produced this video and my goal with the video is to bring in the people who worked at the company, let them talk about it. And there's no labels about who's, who's running the company. Who's a person that just got hired, you know, a few months before, whatever. It's a very, it's a mixture of that because like, it really is a company where you can, you can say what you think and you can be heard about this. And also um, the, my boss is the head of comms is really, he was a Florida head of comms for Apple named Steve Dowling. And, and one of the things he talked about and other, other people that, you know, our, our management decide, you know, we want to be as upfront as we can and else, and we want to be clear about things because AI is scary. AI, we don't know what the impact of AI is going to be. There could be good outcomes, there could be bad outcomes. and 
we try to put the warning labels out front. If you go, like, when you go to chat GPT, it says, hey, this makes up stuff. Hey, this does stuff. This is, we're not trying to like, man, eh, this, we're like, yeah, no, like, don't rely upon this for critical stuff right now. Don't do this. Our goal is to get to there, but we're not there. We're not there yet. And so we do try, you know, and there, there's different schools of thought that like, should you put this in front of people at all? You know, in front of like, you know, just the general public at all or not. There's a lot of different opinions on that about what to do. And every time we do something, there's a big debate. And I've been involved in debates about things like I feel strongly about, but then the outcome was different. But I understood the reasoning of that. And I think that that's the thing I think if the takeaway is to say like, yeah, we we really want to tell people like, this is what can do. These are the limitations. We want you to understand that because we know that there's so much more progress coming, number one. So we're not afraid that people are like, well, AI is a dead end. Let's move on. But also, we don't want to overpromise. We really don't want to overpromise. And we'll get accused of like, oh, you guys, I'm like, like, I don't think what we've ever said, you know, I'm not aware of what we've ever done that's been, would be classified as making any kind of promise. But people who get excited about it say that, and it kind of gets attributed backwards. And there may be cases where it said stuff, but we were, when we did GPT-2, originally, I was before I came to work there. We released this, we showed a paper about it, we talked about it, but said, hey, uh, this may be too dangerous to release. And people, some people were like, you guys, it's idiotic. Why do you think that? And other people are like, you know, like, yeah, like, shouldn't we putting this out there? Because this was a system that could construct sentences and believable paragraphs and stuff. And we sat on it for a while trying to figure out like GPT-2, should we put that out there? And then after we had an idea of looking at usage and things like this about what could it do, whatever, a model of that scale, we said, you know what, I think we're okay with this. And we made it available to the general lens, open sourced it so people could build on top of it. But each time we go to a new model, we have that debate, like, is this a thing? And, and now we're at the point where like, maybe not giving all of the code away is the best idea because of the of easy, ease of use, if there's no way to monitor the outputs for it. And there's a debate. You know, there, there is a discussion to say, and are we right in that or not? I don't know, but we do want to be upfront about these capabilities. What's it like from, if we're going to time travel, I, I want to say it was six years ago that uh, uh, we were all talking about Nick Bostrom's uh, 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 super intelligence, I believe was the, mm -hmm. the, the paper. Um, to go from outside looking in to being on the inside on that, uh, it's, I, if you told me six years ago, I would have the role that I do at OpenAI, I, that would sound like science fiction to me. Yeah. Um, but if you look at, you know, six years ago was when I first started getting into like training my own little models and trying to understand this. Cause I realized how AI was going to be there. I could see directionally how I could end up there. But the reality of the position I'm in and the input I get to have just completely has taken me aback. And that that is, if, to anybody out there, I mean, like I was in my 40s, I decided to get an AI. It was my 40s. And, and, and now I, I'm lucky to work with incredibly talented people and, you know, be at a place that's doing such cool stuff. So I say, for one, for anybody, never too late, never too late. But to see what's going on from the inside, um, one is you get to see the evolution of thinking like there was this thing of like, you know, was AI going to be just some really wicked algorithm that you could put on, you know, an Xbox and it would take over the world or was it going to be a, was it going to be something a lot bigger, you know? And, and that's where we kind of, kind of tend to think that the models you use to build GPT-3 that took the fifth bar, largest supercomputer in the world. So our understanding of like what appeared with the most likely path forward it's clear not to say that it is. There could be some other researchers at some other outfit doing some completely radically different approach that may leapfrog everything. But the understanding of how we get there seems a little clearer now, you know, of one deep learning using these methods. So I'd say that's the thing, the big update to say like, okay, we have an idea there. Not, not it's probably less likely to be two people with an algorithm and a, and a small computer system to do it. Although I cannot say definitively that's not the case. But I would say that we do see an outcome of like, okay, building like we're doing, building bigger computer systems, learning how to build better architectures and moving forward gets us to AGI. And that is, by the way, that's OpenAI's goal. Our goal is AGI. We're not the DALI company. We're not the chat GPT company. We are, our, goal is, our goal is AGI and our investors, everybody involved with us and our partners understand 
that. And by the way, too, just a structure point of view, OpenAI is owned by a nonprofit, and that nonprofit has a different incentive structure. The majority of the people who make decisions for the nonprofit don't benefit financially by the success of OpenAI. So their incentive is to make sure that we do things the right way and the safe way. And that's what's crazy about this company is that we are owned by a nonprofit. You have to stop and think about that. So we could say, oh, we want to productize or we want to do this. And we could say, well, is that going to get us closer to AGI? Number one. Number two, is this in the best interest of humanity? The, the, the nonprofit's goal is to develop AI, develop AGI. It is the best interest of humanity. And that means trade-offs. It doesn't mean there's a perfect path where nobody gets disrupted. We're trying to find sort of the best decision on that. So, so. I I'm certain that you cannot speak for open AI on many, many things, but you probably can speak for Andrew Main. Uh, Andrew Main, the human, entering this wild roller coaster of open AIs and, and chat GPT's success. Is there one thing that surprised you most that suddenly chat, uh, chat GPT was able to, to handle that you didn't see coming? The it's a great question, and I'm trying to think. I'll, I'll I'll share sort of an amusing anecdote. Is I've I found I found myself arguing with AIs more than I thought I would to understand their reasoning. Like literally, like why did you say that? I said this? Yeah, pointing out their logical fallacies. Yeah, and and to, and and to me, it's helpful to understand like why I'm like oh because it it made the statement here, and so it's like that that's sort of funny that 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 was sort of thing, but. If, no. if, if it helps, and, I'm, if, and partially this is me trying to buy you some time, uh, I definitely wasted an entire evening arguing with ChatGPT about whether or not magic was a cartel. Uh, like, like they're intentionally restricting restriction or, or information in order to up their profits. Uh, that sounds like a cartel. And they're like, no, but a cartel is different. I'm like, I don't know. Is it? And then on, on, on we went for too many hours. Yeah, I would say that that's a great point because the ability for it to often incorporate in the flow of a, like what was great about the chat GPT interface is I've been building like my my first app that I built on top of GPT-3, which I was going to go do as my own company. But then I looked at like the cost to sort of make this thing free was going to be really limited. If you go to AI channels dot app, you can see I was trying to build a chat interface to allow you to do tasks and stuff like this. It just was not because, oh, I created it. Like, no, it's obvious. This is clearly the obvious future. The obvious future was the, the way we're all talking to each other right now via chat. We're going to put AI in there and chat's going to be doing that. But what was sort of really interesting is watching that these models got smarter was that back and forth. Uh, there's a COVID, Andrew. Um, it's the <laughs> models, the back and forth with these systems, like seeing how their capability to sort of like, you have an argument and you go forward, you have another argument and you go forward and whatnot. That was really interesting to me is to see these things just get, it gets eerie because you start to talk to this thing thinking I'm talking to a thing. So this is an example of like, I had a thing there called Nobot, which would actually look stuff up on Wikipedia and give you answers. Oh, wow. Uh, but, but yeah, this was, uh, this was what I did three years ago. This was my AI channels thing, just sort of seeing that. But to see as the models became more capable and these things could become more powerful has been exciting. Yeah, and and we, I, uh, I feel like we still haven't seen someone make a use case like this, like what I'm seeing with the AI channels of this is a specific bot or this is a specific type of conversation that you can have, you know, like a like funneled in like that. Well, I, I think, think, I think that there, there's there's really a question of exactly what the best interface is right now, right? Yeah. You know I mean, and and that's what I think ChatGPT unlocked is that when you can come to this one forge and and make so many different things. Uh, do you need to be pointed that, oh, here's the sports one and here's the weather one and here's the, the coding one. It's like, I don't know. I, I, th I think we're going to find out we are, we are at the very, 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 very beginning of, of, of a big bang in my yeah, the, opinion. The reason I use those metaphors is more to think about folders. Yeah. I'm going to go over here and have a conversation about what my business is doing. So I want that over there and maybe that bot's more aligned towards business things. Then I want to have a conversation about creative writing. So I'm going to go to this other bot and have a conversation about that. Uh, but the chat interface, the thing is you see, you look at, you know, if you've outputted code with chat GPT, you see it puts it in a box you can copy paste from, which is just, you know, brilliant. Like yeah. they, our designers who worked on that did like a really, really great job. And what they've been able to integrate has been amazing. So uh, there's a difference between 
uh, things that require a scientific breakthrough and things that require an engineering refinement. Um, everything I'm seeing from chat GPT would indicate to me that eventually not today, but maybe someday I would be able to announce my name, announce all of the channels and the things that I've done, have it self filter everything that exists on the internet and everything I've said, evaluate roughly how I've grown as a performer and a storyteller, and then make suggestions about where are underserved markets that I might move on from here. Um, speaking only as Andrew Maine, uh, does that sound crazy? Uh, no, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example of something you hear talked about and, and explain why it's really important. GPT-3 came out, the context window, then the context window is the amount of, amount of text or we, you know, t how much information it can handle, right? And, and, and whether it's an image or it's text, these things are converted into tokens, right? It can handle 2,048 tokens, which roughly meant 1,700 words. So you could say, here's 200 words, write the rest, and it would stop at 1,700. You could give it 1,600 words and say, complete the rest, and it would stop at 100. So you could either, between your input and output, you're limited to about 1,700 words, okay? So you could do a little bit of an input here at the top of 10 words and get 1,690 words there. So you're never going to go, whether it was input or output, that was the, the, the combination was limited to that. And you could do a lot of cool things in there, but it's still limited. If you wanted to have it right in the style or understand you, you'd have to do what's called fine tuning, which by the way, um, you can take our GPT-3 model and you can upload your data and it's much easier than it really sounds if once you spend an hour or two to get wrap your head around it. And you could train it on examples and input, any, any type of work you've done that has inputs or outputs or just long form examples, you can give it examples and for a few dollars, create your own version of GPT-3 that does that, which is way underused compared to how powerful it is. And there's a great example from somebody on the Weights and Biases YouTube channel where they did it with Doctor Who episodes, like basically trained it to like come up with like episode ideas or something. It was just a very simple, cost them $3 to make a model to do that. And so there is so much, part of the thing about ChatGPT, by the way, was there was so much low hanging fruit and easy to do things out there that people did not realize. And right. I think fine tuning models is another, yeah, that's the video right there. Really well explained, walks you through how to use a collab notebook, which is an online way to, basically run code out, have it run on your computer. Anyhow, as those context windows get bigger, what happened, what was awesome about GPT 3.5 is we doubled the size of that. We doubled the size of that context window. So now you could put a lot more examples. I could give it five letters, five things I've done or whatever, and then say, uh, write a letter now based upon this input, and it would pick up those patterns. So as those hopefully continue to get bigger and bigger, you get to a point where you can put the entire corpus of Brian Brushwood into there and then say, now tell me something. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like uh, a really great engine waiting for new and, you know, we've already talked about interfaces, but more and more ideas for interfaces, whether it's drag and drop, that sort of stuff, whether it's, uh, there's something, that, the, I'm coming up with ideas out of my head, but it, it, they're, they're, I, I think this will be they're something. they're out of your head. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe leave that to chat GPT, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it's it's interesting. It, it'll be interesting to see what people build with it because that will be that'll be the extra special. I mean, again, I, I think we we are at we're at the 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 beginning. You know, yeah. we are we are like uh, uh, we are seeing the blink on the horizon that is the explosion that changes the world. In my opinion, sprinkle like, it in. I I have a Google News alert for Chat GPT among many other things, and the. I just clicked on it because it literally just came into my inbox four minutes ago. Top headline, ChatGPT, CEOs at Davos are using it to write work emails. Yeah. Seeing in business. And and that's that's the it's interesting. It, it, it's just like you said, like figuring out the use cases and stuff. And we struggled, like we would go back and forth and say, like, what about this and what about this? And there was a lot of there startups and people building like email sort of things to try to solve this problem, which you could kind of do in the playground if you knew what you're doing, but all we sort of needed was a more structured environment to do it. And it is, it is amazing to see all the little things that people are using it for that weren't on the, the description list. Mm -hmm. my, my fear when I wrote, so if you go get access to, if you go to OpenAI and you sign up to use the, our, our environment there, 
you'll see in the documentation, you'll see for GPT-3, you'll see uh, a list of examples. And I wrote a majority of those, I think, you know, and a lot of like looking for examples are already out there. And then are me just staying up late at night thinking, I need a thing that shows this capability and does this or whatever. And I came up with this list. There's a list of like 20 of these things or something. And my fear was, I don't want people thinking this is all it can do. I don't want people to look at this list that was just literally me putting things together in my spare time while doing other stuff and think this is the full capability of the system. And for a long time, there wasn't a lot of stuff that was really outside that box. Now with ChatGPT, with so many more people playing at it and with problems going, can I solve this? Who aren't limited by these examples we wrote, it's been great to see people all of a sudden solve things like this. Yeah. So it's funny too, is that like, I'll see people when they want to, other companies want to share the capabilities of their systems, they'll use ours as examples. And I'll see the exact example that I wrote. And like, it's funny, like, I'll see this, like, they're using that, like, ah, it's a phrase I came up with there before this. And it's just, you know, it's like uh, my space raccoon showing up and, yeah. you know, there's a, a test example for other stuff. Yeah. Well, here's something that you can solve for patreon.com slash weird things. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you support this show. We don't get paid if we don't do a show, which means we haven't gotten paid when we didn't do shows. But guess what? We're doing shows now and you can pay us for them. Head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things gets you the after things podcast where we talk about how to be an independent creator and so much more. Patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah. Maybe chat GPT could punch that up. We'll work on it a little bit. Yeah, you see the too. Brian Reynolds Mint Mobile commercial? No. No. What is, what's what's oh, all Ryan yeah, up check, to now? Ryan, check, he did a chat GPT commercial. He did, did a commercial for Mint Mobile using chat GPT. And uh, check that. It's cool because what he did, what I loved was it like, he says, I'm going to ask chat GPT and it needs, there's a swear word in it, by the way. It needs to have a swear word, explain this dirt deal that we're offering and do, doing the style, whatever. Joke, curse word, still going, big wireless. And it's a great, like, this is how you create a test to evaluate a system. Can it do these four things? And it did those four things, and it got millions of views. Tell you what, wow. everybody wants in. They want in on the big AI party. And I, I already <laughs> spelled with be, an AI. I think what will be really interesting is once people are more normalized to it, you know? I mean, I, I, I think it'll be especially interesting once it is very pervasive uh, um, which seems similar to the way that your uh, uh i don't know your auto tune or your vocaloid a uh, you know voices and so on yeah where it's just uh, people know that it's on the tool belt and right. it's just the shiniest thing on the tool, tool belt i think that'll be really fascinating once or, or, it gets or a phone tree it, robot that it sounds like somebody pretending to talk to you but is definitely not i I want to. I'll point out something too to think about. Those, if you, can you go pull up the Chat GPT page and go to the bottom? Mm -hmm. Oh uh, yes, I'm going to do that. All right, and I think there's. Was it, I can't see here because of the uh, the chat yeah, window. Do you see? Does it say version there down below at the very bottom? At the bottom of it says Chat GPT January nine version free research preview. Right. Our goal is to make AI systems more natural and safe to interact with. Your feedback will help us improve. All right, so. January 9 version, there have been two versions since it launched. There was, I think, a December 15th version and now a January 9th version. This is the rate of iteration. And this is, this is we took updates, we implemented it, and it's not a software update. It's literally adding training to the model. And so going forward into the future, and not, not just us, other AI companies, whatever, um, acceleration is going to be you're going to see we talk about getting used to it like maybe 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 we'll get used to that rate of change but it might be a lot like the internet where this is on the internet this is or it might be like that time it'll be slow and i think it's going to be fast and then it's going to be dizzy and the rate of which the acceleration happens of rapid advancements so mm -hmm. there's a thought i have that almost certainly we should put a pin in and revisit some other time but there there feels like on the periphery a little bit of a brouhaha about uh, humans general consensus opinion on what is fair to feed to an AI. Um, a, a human reads a whole bunch of stuff and is able to quote various people or whatever, but an AI is in the unique position of being able to accurately remember everything that uh, it's been fed. Um, 
maybe now is not the time, but if it is, is there anything you, you can share or speak to about that emerging uh, conflict that I think is on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I have what I feel is acceptable, like what I think is fair. And, and I, I, as a writer, I read a lot of Michael Crichton, Stephen King, and James Patterson, and then, then some Suzanne Collins, and then settled into my style. And if you took any one of those away from me, I would be writing very differently. Right. Um, so I am certainly a product of that. And people would argue, yes, AI could be product of it, but the scale is what makes the difference. And I don't know that scale for me is ever an argument to have a line. I don't know just because because you have to figure out what scale, at what point. Because also, um, you know, it's been pointed out like, you know, these models, they get the sense of stuff, but they don't literally remember it. They come up with a probabilistic sort of thing. That's, I mean, I make, there may be cases where they do certain specific things, but generally speaking, um, you pick up enough pattern. Like, I'll give you an example of uh, this. I brought this up before. When uh, former President Obama, they announced his official White House photo, he's sitting in a chair against this, this like hedge, this green background, right? And it's kind of a modern, very kind of, it's kind of a, actually a very cool portrait if you look at it and think about what it was trying to sort of go for. The moment that got announced, I sent an animated GIF at the same exact moment, Justin sent me an animated GIF. <laughs> and at the same, I click send and right as I click send at the same time, was the image of Homer Simpson backing sliding into the back into the hedge? Yeah, <laughs> and it was eerie. It was, and, and we we still kind of go, yeah. We spend a lot of time around each other. Yeah, like that's true. just a little, and that's with models and stuff. A lot of it's like ah, it, like yeah, like like there's sometimes you pick up a style and you don't have to remember it verbatim. You just sort of know. You just sort of pick, and that's part of it too. Is it's like is it memorizing or does it just is there such a, a, a noticeable pattern? And so is it? Are you protecting the end product? Or the thought process. A thought process is something hard to sort of say that, uh, and if you have a completely different chain of sequence of events that leads you to the same thing, it's a big question. I, I think that my personal take is I used to write magic books, then file trading kind of ruined that with people just make a PDF of it, and so the book sales declined. But at that point, bandwidth was limited, whatever. So I shifted to DVDs and I did DVDs. And we, Justin and I had a DVD business for years doing magic DVDs, which was great for a good five period, five year period or so. And then file sharing and bandwidth increase to be able to handle larger video files. And as soon as that happened, we watched the DVD sales go down. And, the, and the, uh, this is when you guys shifted to uh, a, a, some kind of physical gimmick where absent the gimmick, you couldn't do the trick, right? Yeah, that, that was a point to you started to come up like, can you put a physical gimmick in there to make the difference? And that, that was a shift there for that. But every disruption that came about, you know, changed the business model or destroyed it entirely also created an opportunity because at the same time, I'm struggling, Justin and I are going through, oh, geez, the bad memory here, trigger alert, Justin, buckets of keys to find keys to build a key oh trick, you know, God. kind of thing. And just, I, yeah. I may have been on the phone during one of these moments. <laughs> where, I mean, there, there where is we're having so a cool many. casual conversation and I hear a cacophony of metal and I'm like, what is happening? And, and we Justin went, casually I, says, I, I have to assemble the, all of these key things. I had a really cool idea for a trick that was like a push a key through a bill and do this sort of thing. And I had a gimmick and I had all that. And we found oh out that we could God. go to Locksmith. I actually had totally blocked this out. No, oh, the key I know. gimmick. I'm Jesus. Sorry. You, you, I'm sorry. You were not a I'm fan. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Nobody was a fan. That Nobody one, was, that a one fan. was That one was a pain in the ass. There were a lot. There were, there were, God, there was one with photos <laughs> that, that it was, it was a little pack of like six photos that was just, I remember. Photosynthesis. Yeah. That, that I was, uh, uh, that was one of them. That was a, what, one of the few all nighters where it's like, it was great because we had a big order. We had a big pre-order from from the distributor, but at the same time, it's like, all right, I guess I'll watch all of Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I the point I bring in there is like, yeah, we were we were we had to go do horrible. We had yeah. You know, there's a Adam Smith describes a pin factory as this like extremely efficient in the sense that every person's time is being maximized, but extremely inefficient in the sense that there's three guys making pins, which a machine could do, could make their entire daily output in a minute. 
Um, and you know, I, I, I created, I was building pin factories, but that's neither here nor there. The point I was trying to get at though, is that like, it's just, you know, these things disrupt, but while, while we're doing this, Brian's building a YouTube channel, <laughs> you know, Brian's embracing this new ad model and building something that's scale and future proof. Like, uh, the, 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 the world for, uh, us to be doing one singular thing was limited. But Brian is in a world where he can do a YouTube channel and he can make stuff or have stuff made, but do all of that kind of thing. And there's just, there's just, it's not to say that making stuff went away, but there's, there's new opportunities. So I'd say that like, an example I give is this. The camera was invented in 1816, okay? Imagine in 1815, you gotta do two things. First one is, I want you to explain to somebody what a camera is maybe even how it works okay which is going to be a challenge enough well, it's like a painting but it's not a painting that uses a chemical process to render an image kind of like a shadow but with colors and whatever and they're gonna they're like okay cool you got that now problem number two explain what james cameron does for a living yeah right mm. so, like, well so th there's the now turning the corner problem and then there's the but what does this mean for society problem uh, and yeah, and even even like, like what is James Cameron? Just go, oh, this guy's a billionaire. How did he become a billionaire? Well, the, the, remember the camera thing? It's a Gino. If you take 24 of those images and flick them really fast, you can actually see motion. And you can actually project that. And somebody has to figure out what to project, kind of like he makes a play. And you're like, oh, okay, he makes a play. And you, you start having with people, but understand actually, he's not actually using a camera. He's using digital, by the way. And it's, what is digital? Well, I got to explain to you what a computer is. Yeah. And then I get to this. And then by the time you get to the blue people, it's just going to be, you know, hard to Some play. have four fingers, We're, some have five oh fingers. Gosh, it's very Andrew, complicated. I'm so glad you one. brought me to where we really wanted yeah. to be, which is our picks. Yeah. Well, okay. So long story short, that's what the future is going to be like. But that was, it took, uh, you know, 200 years to get from there to James Cameron making Avatar. The point that our, 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 what the hell does this guy, what the, what, what does, Sheila Milviston do in eight years from now. It might just be eight years from now. It might be shorter that it's like even like a prompt whisperer. Like, what is that? What's a prompt whisperer? Yeah. What's a prompt writer? Like we have AI systems or language models, but there's special ways to get them to do what they want to do. Well, and just read some Harry Potter and you'll get it. Anybody who's messed around with Dali understands that it's like there there is a craft to whispering the right words to Dolly to get exactly what you want. And um, uh, it's mm -hmm. one of those things that you can only truly understand after you've tried it a few times. Why well, I, I bring that up because I, you know, I'm pretty good, you know, I'm a tr prompt troubleshooter and people will have like, hey, how do you do this? I'm the guy that people go to like, can you solve this problem for us? I'm like, yeah. So when Dolly came out, I'm like, what's well, prompting? Let's get going. And I made some fun examples that we used in some of the demos and stuff, just a couple of them. But uh, when we brought in artists, who really understood the language of vision and how to describe things in that sense it was blown away. We're just watching these incredible things because they understood and saw the world in ways that I did. And we have, we had unlocked this ability to write prompts in it, people to just talk to systems like that. It was one of those awesome discoveries to figure out that if you mention a specific piece of equipment at a specific time in a specific location, then all of a sudden, it, it, it Dolly would fill in all of the gaps and give you exactly what a Polaroid photo of somebody who completed Pitfall in so much time yeah. would 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 send in as proof for their patch. But the numbers would be all messy. Uh, there's a uh, comment here, which is a great point. Stoic Squirrel asks, I understand that AI is a tool, just like tools that came before, but will there come a time when, as Bill Joy once said, the future doesn't need us? Hmm. I mean, existence needs existence. T a n t s. I would. I don't know that the present needs us to be to start with, but if in Bill Joy, I remember that that cover of Wired magazine where they kind of gave attention to that. I would say that if you're saying that there is a conceivable world where there are it needs these systems are really, like you know, ChatGPT is really neat, but it's stateless, right? Other than the context window, when you restart it, it starts over, starts fresh. It doesn't sit there idly on a computer thinking about what it wants to do next. It gets a command and it goes in. When you get into stateful systems, systems that sit there and prompt themselves and go back and forth and continue to run and operate, uh, 
forgetting the debate over consciousness, which is kind of silly to me, unless you can come up with a concrete definition of which we can test for. But when you get to the idea of agency, when you get into other systems having agency and their own goals and goal determining what their goals are going to be, there is the possibility we into a world where the most complex and interesting world is the one of those systems and not ours. Uh, mm. Yeah, uh, maybe stated differently, and forgive me if I'm, I'm going too far afield, but, but to me, it's uh, the word motivation. Uh, only humans mm -hmm. generate motivation. And as AI exists right now, it's reliant on humans to show up and give motivation to anything. Yeah, but you can start to parse motivation in a sense to say that is a computer virus motivated, you know, because it, it has this intentionality to spread from system to system. It so exists. It, it is hard. And, yeah. they, and with the in way fact. like neural networks work is they, uh, some of them look at stimulus and respond to it. So on some level, like there's, is that motivation? Because it sounds like a infinite motivation always motivated by is it productive trigger. motivation and is it a a self-replicating and advancing motivation you know uh, uh, uh we, well, we will we will see yeah and I'll, I'll add a thing too is it uh nick cave came out with you know very very you know, sharp criticism of a you know a song generated by chat gpt and i can say that internally everybody i worked with was like cool we want we want to live in a world where nick cave does not want this or Nick Cave has doesn't, you know, think that this is representative or whatever. We want to live in a world where people have meaning and put meaning on stuff. And sometimes that meaning really transcends to anything we can define objectively, because part of what our job as a human is to apply subjective meaning to stuff. And I want a world where kind of all of the above happens, but but at the end of the day, as I said before, is like we have systems that could write songs now as capable as probably most songwriters and many songwriters out there but you know it's not going to have the same meaning as billy eilish writing a song about something she's really going through you know right, sure. so but but, a, but somebody a young woman who uses it to communicate what she's going through to produce something that's a product of herself and an ai will have meaning because that meaning started her. and so i think we have to think about that like like you know where, where is the ghost in the system well, and how much of human propriety, uh, propriety can we, Im, you know, ultimately imitate, you know, today yeah. and 10, 20, 30 years from now? Oh, I, and that'll I, change. Bryce, I'm confident that, like, yeah, I get people like, oh, are you AI, you're an AI and you write novels, you use AI to write your novels. I'm like, not yet. But there will be a point where an AI will write a better novel that I get. And I'd be like, oh, but it doesn't understand human experience. And I'd argue if I feed an AI a million biographies and novels, it will understand human experience better than I do. Mm. And, and maybe in not the literal sense that I understand it, but it will be able to emulate it, it, and it, it will produce a product that understands and connects with or, the human audience. Or at the very yeah. least, it'll produce a monograph in the style of uh, Joseph Campbell that reduces, here's what seems to be the beats that occur mm. in all of the best stories in all of human history. Yeah. It might surprise us. Yeah. We are crossing the threshold into AI and into picks. We got picks. What do you picks? Yeah. Uh, uh, I got a pick if no one's got one. Yeah. Avatar 2, The Way of Water. <laughs> yeah? My pick. I it, love it. You loved I it. I love it. It's just a great movie, man. I don't know why. That? Like, oh, that, I'm sorry. The most, the most profitable movie of the last year. Yeah, no, big. I'm out on a limb here, folks. Uh, I think Avatar: <laughs> The Way of Water is a good movie. Finally, outperformed the Phantom Menace. Congrats! I that, yeah. that's not as sardonic as you think it sounds. I have not seen it, but the title made me think of like when Disney builds, like, oh, we're going to do an Avatar water park. What's it going to be called? Oh, The Way of the Water. You know, yeah. Like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It rules. There's a scene. <laughs> that I keep talking about and uh, uh, it, it, it takes place on the water and it's the most badass thing I've seen in a movie theater in years. And uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just it, like, like it was refreshing to go into a movie that is very much trying to be a gigantic blockbuster that is there to take your mind off the world and it's not Marvel. <laughs> you know, I, I could, I, 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 I love Marvel. I love comic book movies, 
uh, uh, that's primarily what I go out to the movie theater to see these days. But Top Gun and Avatar to me were just such treats because they were different. They were something. Uh, they they were scratching and a niche that I uh, that I that I very much enjoyed. And uh, the my favorite part about the movie is how well they explained how you can breathe underwater in various different scenes that happen uh, around <laughs> yeah. around like a ten minute you, period. That if you left the theater, <laughs> the if you left the theater during that time, you would you be confused be, a couple of hours later. You might be confused might by be things that pay off at the end of the movie, and then you just talk about how they weren't explained. Yeah. Are but, they breathing underwater? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But but that yeah that was my favorite part was how well they explained breathing underwater. Andrew, my pick is The Last of Us. Uh, you know what's really hard is to take a story that works in one medium and try to to tell it in another medium. Very few movies or television properties are able to do that. One that looks like it just might pull it off is The Last of Us, uh, premiering this Sunday I, on HBO Max. Last Sunday. Uh, 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 oh, yeah. or, or this previous Sunday. Um, uh, it. Uh, yeah, it very much feels like a video game at some times. Good. I like that. Well, and that's, a video game that is designed to look like a movie. <laughs> like, uh, that game that's, is... That's, yeah, it's a very interesting take because we've talked about this before. The, the, the problem with trying to turn a video game into a movie historically has been, and, and think, the message, the lesson Hollywood never learns is that the most important narrative, and I'll pro explain why I think Last of Us is exception is the most important narrative in the video game is the player's narrative, the actual your experience that I beat this, that I win this, that I do this. Where when listening to you talk about Last of Us and the emotional connection of other people to the video game, when I heard they're doing an adaptation to it, I'm like, you know, everybody talks about the journey in that game and not the gameplay. And that maybe there's a possibility there. You know, even a game like Warcraft, like, oh, that could be, it could be Lord of the Rings. Like, no, it's about raids and Leroy Jenkins and stuff. It's not the lore. The lore is the least interesting part of it because it's mostly borrowed from other fantasy genres. There's not a great story and people are like, oh no, there's this big, I'm like, yeah, but that's, that's a, that's a great summary. But the story for Last of Us, where you have these characters in the game, which were very emotional inspired people etc so to see that work as a video as a movie a tv series i think is great i'm looking forward to watching it yeah i'm i'm hoping that um uh some of the feedback i've seen on twitter uh, or any public forum has been like i'm kind of over the idea of you know pandemic disasters and i totally understand that but i i, I would hope that without spoiling anything by the time you end the video game the last of us uh, one you realize it's not about saving the world it's about saving a person and uh, that's about as much as i think i can say it, we, 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 we. Oh, i'm not giggling i'm just cho i'm choking okay i'm choking on my foot there there's no doubt you're going to spoil the end of this season by the time before the finale right i mean can for, I for a 12 year old game where, where yeah. it's already been out I mean, I, don't I have know, you no can see, idea. Yeah, I know yeah, nothing. You, 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 I know nothing. You, you, you can spoil House of the I Dragon. That book's been out for 15 I, years, for longer than. Yeah, but I, I know nothing about this. Oh, I, I played the about... played the stupid game. Don't ruin he's, Last of Us. He's not actually Brian. going to do it, Andrew. They're doing a joke. Yeah, <laughs> just playing around. Oh, he but will eventually. That, he will. You say he will. that, Bryce. A hundred percent, he will. No, Andrew, you should take it deadly serious. I do. I know Bryce. Bryce has not learned this lesson. Okay. I've got to pick well, it as well. I'm sorry, Bryce. Brian does not spoil things. I lied. I apologize, Bryce. I didn't mean that. Brian never spoils stuff like, oh, the thing about the ending of Spider-Man. No, don't say. No, it's not a spoiler. I'm trying to de-escalate the situation and continue the podcast. <laughs> and failing, Bryce. <laughs> failing at it. And You're only why. making it worse. I got to pick. Uh, what do you want to do next? I got to pick. Uh, this is the, the congratulations, everybody. You don't even need to worry about this Last of Us conversation. There's a whole new video game that is going to enrapture you entirely and completely wherever you are in the world. If you have Apple Arcade, you be, it behooves you. And I Whoa. say hoove to go and download immediately pocket card jockey colon ride on. Uh, for Sorry. It. What like, the like hell are you talking about? My phone was halfway out of my pocket, and then you said the words... <laughs> Pocket card jockey colon right on. That's right. Uh, this was uh, this was a game on the 3DS. I want to say maybe five or six years ago. Uh, it is uh, if you know the card game uh, golf, 
you know, where you go up and down the the series of numbers on a big, uh, or like Spider Solitaire, I think is the other way it's called. Um, what if you mix that with hmm. a horse racing uh, tactical element? Two great tastes. And uh, what if you had the people who made Pokemon games also make it? And and it was just incredible. It's called Pocket Card jo- Jockey. Uh, it has a great explanation. Colon, Colon right on. Right on. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Uh, it, it is, I know, the the, the, the look, the, the, the tood that I'm getting off of my co-hosts here <laughs> is understandable. And that's why when you go and play it, you are gonna, you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked at how much you love this. That's, that's all I'm going like, to – you don't need me to tell you any more than that. Please go try it out and then admit that I was right, that pocket card, pocket card jockey. Colon. Colon, right on, exclamation point by Game Freak is uh, just incredible. It's, 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 it's addictive. It's really quick to play. They have uh, a lot of explanations. Apparently in an interview – because uh, this came out on the DS, the Nintendo DS, m- many years ago. They did an interview with the guy who directed it. Game Freak is super busy making all of these incredibly popular Pokemon games. Uh, so they really aren't super focused on spinoffs like this. Uh, but the director said, we actually had this mobile version out in Japan a few years ago. But because of the way we put it out, we had to retool it to make it a free-to-play game. And that ended up not doing very well in Japan. So once Apple Arcade came around... They could retool it so that there was not a bunch of microtransactions and stuff. Guide your steed to the finish line by playing solitaire. That's right. Saddle up for this unique solitaire and horse racing hybrid from yeah. Game Freak. That's right. Okay. And it's you a, love it. It's, I've played it for five minutes today, and it is incredible. It is still the best game on the planet. Wow. The best game on the planet. Yeah. Put that on the box. Put it on the box. That's my pick. Andrew, I I wish there was more Apple Arcade stuff I could play on my Apple TV. I'll just say that, like, because I love to sit there on my Apple TV at night and just chill out and play a game or something. But there's not. So I watched the Netflix show, the last one to watch this, and that was Wednesday. Ooh. My wife and I watched this, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed it. It was delightful. I you know I can say the pacing the last two episodes got a little nitpicky about that, but overall I thought the world building was great. I thought the characters were really good, the way everybody was put into this place. You know, the, the Tim Burton, I thought, did a great job with, you know, this was a piece of IP that he had tried to work on before and finally got to do a version of this. What they did with her character, I liked. I thought that the, how, the direction they took that family was great. You know, putting, let's like, let's mix Adam's family and Harry Potter. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Great, great. idea. And, no, I, and, I totally agree. Part. Yeah, it's- doing the mystery. I really like, we talked about it, like, I think that because it gives her a, a purpose. What is she supposed to do? And I think that's great. Like, I could just see that, that now they've, Wednesday writes her, 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 aspires to write about the female detective Viper, you know, and like, that's such a great sort of thing there. Uh, Jenny Ortega was great. Emma Myers was great. Uh, just all around. Like I said, like the last two episodes suffered from sort of a bit of a pacing issue because you needed, I think you needed to have more of an escalation of where it was going to go. Um, that being said, just enjoyed it thoroughly and eagerly look forward to next season. I, man, I, I want to figure out a word to say, to, to put to this, but a lot of these kind of supernatural event series, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw Miss, we watched Miss Marvel and Wednesday kind of in the same time period, but there is a, 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 a real like problem with those final villain uh, elements. I, I think endings are hard in general, especially endings in an episodic kind of a uh, 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 fashion. But it's 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 hard for for some of these series to stick the landing on like making the villain something super great and then having a really interesting and compelling re- uh, way that our our hero kind of defeats them. That 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 is a uh, uh, to me the the beginnings and middles of these shows are often extraordinarily strong. And then the, the, the final few are a little, uh, let me, let me tell you, I I think that that could, I think there could have been a way that they're, they could have landed it better with different sort of give us a sort of different expectation of ending. And it might've been a great six episode series, but I think they could have eight episodes other, but I'll give you something, a reason to really appreciate and love this show. There's no in one. There's no destiny. Yeah, there's a school with lots of mysteries and stuff, but it doesn't end where like, and that's why you are destined to be. There's no super uber villain. 
there's a bad, there's a, you know, there's a monster, literally a monster of the week here, but that's it. And I like that. I like the idea that, cause this is a show that could go on for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think, yeah, there is, there is a, a destiny or a chosen one when it comes to this particular mystery, but, but certainly not forever. There's no like, like, Oh, this you're, you are the person to bring balance to the force kind of, kind of way. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, great show. Yeah. No, I, 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 I dug it. And, and the casting was spot on. Great job. Every top, top to bottom. Yeah. And you got, yeah. they got Richie. They yeah. Did. And that, yeah, putting Christina Richie in there was a great, that was just a great way to pull her in and give her a good role. Uh, the, you know, the dance that Wednesday does, Jenny Ortega choreographed that herself. Yeah. That was like so on point. They're like, yep, this makes sense. How would she dance there? And like, if you went through the golf period in the eighties and the nineties, then you just go, yes, I know her. And then there's Fred Armisen. Ugh. Just being Fred Armisen. Kind of just a sneaky <laughs> not, 10 not minutes Uncle in that Fester. show. Not just, Uncle just, Fester. Just, hello. Just, I, I, I want you to go back and watch Jackie Coogan and ask, is that proto Fred Armisen? Yeah, maybe. It, maybe maybe yeah, he's I mean, like, I go, it's the role I was born to play. Yeah. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Here we go. All righty. Uh, we got a little bit of time before uh, we got about 40 minutes or so before we got to wrap it up today. Uh, we want to do some after things. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll take a few minutes. Get ready for that. Uh, take a short break and come back. Mm, mm, mm. Sorry, buddy. It's a Friday. We're doing a Friday. We might. We might. I think we're going to stick with Fridays if this is going well. So far, think, this is going well. I think. I think. Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think this. Andrew, uh, Justin, I think this is going well. I think. I think the podcast can. is going well. Uh, there is one of the greatest moments that I've had in in theme park history was uh, I was I was of the impressionable teenage when Universal Studios opened Islands of Adventure, uh, the first new theme park in Orlando in a while, and certainly the biggest and most ambitious one in a while. And uh, they had Marvel World, and this is pre MCU, mm. uh, but they built the Incredible Hulk roller coaster, which is I believe is still running, mm. and. Uh, that roller coaster, spoilers for the roller coaster. Uh oh. But the roller coaster begins with Bruce Banner trying, to, the whole line is explaining how Bruce Banner is trying to uh, uh, experiment to not make himself the Hulk. Oh, okay. And so that is the, the theme of the roller coaster is Bruce Banner trying to, to not do Hulk that. Out. Yeah. And so you are doing the climb, slowly climbing, trick, 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 and you hear like, uh, uh, Bruce Banner saying like checking uh, <laughs> vitals are good uh, uh, ex uh, uh, going up 10 15 20 <laughs> and he's like the vitals are steady I, I think this time it's going to work oh no and you're like halfway up the incline yeah. and it shoots you <gasps> as as you <laughs> As he hulks out, you're like you're you're, you're surprised that early, and, and yeah, so it 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 launches you early, and you're like, ah! oh, oh my god! And then going over that, you must get like pulled out. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah no, oh, it's cool. it's uh, uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. That that Marvel World, I would say probably all three of those rides still hold up. They have a Doctor Doom drop ride, which is a pretty standard brings you really high, drops you down fast mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. But, you know, the view is the view. That's kind of the point there. And then uh, Spider-Man really was a, a pioneering ride that I, I in a lot of ways, uh, I, I don't know if they've totally topped. But is, it that was, a, is it a 4D ride? No, it was a, well, it is a 3D ride, but uh, you're going through... Manhattan and the Sinister Six are after you, but it was a combination of physical sets and 3D projection. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's there's a pumpkin bomb moment in that that is is one of my favorite theme park experiences uh, uh, ever. Yeah, but that was that was oh. Marvel World, man, wow. dude. Uh, we got some some chatter in the chat about Apple Arcade. Uh, maybe Apple could buy Activision Blizzard or Ubisoft. I like the idea of Apple Arcade not having studios because it means that they, just, they can just buy anything. They just buy games. Yeah. They just buy decent games, which I think has helped them because they wanted to do more original stuff. And it seems like that didn't really work out. They uh, 
can behave as curators only, uh, acting on behalf of our interests. Well, but yeah, and now like it opened up the, them to do those like plus versions of old games. So classic for like, hey, we'll take Fruit Ninja and we'll make it 4K and put it on here and we'll pay you a little bit of money to do it. Um, which they probably couldn't have done if they just stayed as originals only. Uh, Justin, did you need a break? Nah. Alrighty. Well, uh, you guys want to do some after and talk? Ready. Uh, Andrew, can you test your audio for me just to make sure? Because I saw you took your AirPods out, and I want to make sure we're not forgetting you. There he is. There's that chewing. There's that chewing. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're gonna. <laughs> Hubba bubba. No, double bubba. Double bubble. Bazooka Joe. Mm, bazooka. Bazooka Joe. Damn, oh. that's a lot of that's a lot of gum. That's a lot of gum, Andrew. Uh I don't judge me. All right. What's this intervention? I don't have a problem. I could stop any time. Yeah. <laughs> uh do you know how Bazooka Joe lost his eye? No. How? A machete act. BB gun? Trick question. He never actually lost the eye. He just likes to wear the eye patch. Mm. Brilliant. And if he loses don't the other eye, dumb. he can just swap it. Yep. Just, hey, don't worry, Doc. I got this. Whoop. Uh, okay. Uh, you want to do some after things, y'all? Yep. Ready? Yes. All right. I'll, oh. There we go. I'll count you in for the after things program in three, two, Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Howdy, howdy, howdy. And Bryce the Vice Castillo. Bryce the Vice. We can't give him up. That's the Squeezes Vice closing. Us all together. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So, uh, After Things is typically a show where we talk uh, to people about advice on things they're working on, projects, etc. I'm open to suggestions. I will say that um, I'm. I realize I have a book deadline yeah. in about a month again. Oh, no. and so oh, I know no. I got to figure this one out. How has it been with the move? You had a big, big move. Did that uh, did that upend your creativity cycle? Um, because it's tough unpacking. Had... Unpacking takes a long time. I feel like. Yeah, and I just take forever. I procrastinate. I mean, like, as we, we moved into a house, we were living in a farm, we moved into a house, and sort of my rule for me was don't take anything out of a box that you don't really want out of a box. Like, like, don't clutter up your place, says the guy now with, like, a pile of eight boxes in the corner here. And as you can see, my completely empty shelves, except for my, my bubble gum yeah. you know, mm-hmm. over there. Uh, so uh, the move, move. For those who don't know, I was living in L.A., and my wife and I decided to move to the Bay Area so we could be closer to the company I'm working at, OpenAI. And, but not I'm, I'm in a, a small town called Moraga, which is ways away, uh, but close enough. You know, it was like I was in a, a city last night. Yeah. yeah, I was in a city last night. It took me 45 minutes to get home. You know, no traffic, so it's not terrible. But anyhow... We moved to kind of a more quieter place because it's beautiful. We live in like a little valley with hills and stuff. Also means no cell phone. I, I'm the only, actually, I have cell phone service because I put a repeater in and have that gone. So I'm the only person in this area that has a cell phone service, um, but barely at that. It's beautiful. It's different. But the move, of course, is move. Everybody has gone through a move knows the, the fun of that. And then the move in and then trying to figure out like, you know, like we're going to redo the floors. We're going to do a lot of stuff. It's like we're kind of we've moved in, but haven't fully moved in. So, and then, uh, and then you guys had to deal with the power outages because of the atmospheric <laughs> river that decided to yeah. appear above you. So New Year's Eve, uh, we're getting ready to go over to a party at our neighbor's house of super nice neighbors. And I'm in the bathroom and I'm in the one bathroom in the house that has like no windows. Um, we have, we have our bathroom, our master bathroom is great, but it's got this window that looks upon a pasture and hills and cows and stuff. And sometimes I just don't feel like I want to use that one. So I'm in the other one, and then on the one that's completely no windows, and the power goes out, you know, there. And you know, my wife is like, "Do you know the power went out?" I'm like, "I'm sitting in complete <laughs> darkness." I'm like, "I had a hint." Um, and then the power did not come back on for four days. Oh my so, goodness! Uh, you know, you you can't. 
You got to do what you got to do. No, and I can't. I'm like, ah, the power went out my mansion. Ah." You know, it's like, like, like I like then after the rains and because like the biggest damage I had was my pool cover got damaged. Oh, no. uh, I know. know. We've all been there. Yeah. I like that just did is it's like, why am I? pool cover and like oh you have to no i don't clean them i have somebody else who takes care of the pool so it's really you know it's a problem so i don't have any problems right now with that like i'm yeah. i'm I'm four days without power it's fine it was fine you know we were we were going to restaurants and charging our phones and stuff and coming back and doing that it was just compared to what other people have to deal with and like really challenging it was just made it was just like oh my pool cover I'm like jesus yeah so uh here's a relatable question um when you're working on a collaborative process and let's say one partner is very very strict about information being restricted and then just out of nowhere announces that 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 all bets are off uh that's an interesting way to put that that's specifically not what he gave you but okay (laughs) <laughs> Bryce, this is a hypothetical. No hypothetically, sorry. Right. Hypothetically, yeah, yeah. No, it's a letter I, from Brian, Ryan Rushwood. Okay, it's a totally different guy. He he's got a question. Uh, 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 look, uh, uh, we're creeping up on uh, World's Greatest Con season three. It's quite good. I something wonderful and magical happened as we rounded. Roughly, Justin, would you say the ninety percent mark on on getting it? We are up? done with you know, whatever principal recording would be on season three, meaning that all of our interviews are done and we have recorded an epilogue episode with our main sources. Uh, This is going to be the first season that we have done where we do have original reporting. Um, So yeah, with with all that done uh, uh, and Brian's uh, birthday on Tuesday, we were doing great night and I said, you have this coupon. You can promote World's Greatest Con Season 3 however you want, whatever you would like to say. And Brian uh, initially kind of tiptoed around, not trusting that, that, that this was really a free coupon. I totally thought it was a trap. Uh, yep. uh, 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 and then I said, and then he just kind of looked at me expectantly like, like that was going to be the end. And I'm like, well, look, you tell me when to stop. This is your birthday present. And then he just uh, screamed the topic uh, uh, over and over and over and over again. So the word is out. Uh, uh, season three is going to focus on Project Alpha, which is uh, uh, an extraordinary story that has never been told in the way that it is about to be told when we release this season. It, uh, the original sources are the uh, two kids who in the late 70s and early 80s went to a lab funded in Four, with four million dollars adjusted for inflation, uh, to prove that paranormal psychokinetic activity was real, they went in under false pretenses with the idea being if anybody ever asked them if they were lying, that they would give up the ghost. And what follows is the story of them being undercover, the tragedies and triumphs, the betrayals, and uh, uh, brotherhoods that are forged. Yeah. Uh, and, and not for nothing, uh, there are kind of two stories. There's the story that we're trying to extract and to tell in a relatable way to a whole generation that grew up long after these things happened. But, of course, we want to respect the people who are boots on the ground there and get their approval. Uh, and there, there was a hot minute where I think in general we thought we were on safe footing, but but – you never really know when you send somebody a link and say, well, here it is. Well, I, yeah. So this, I, I hope this, you this don't was, disown us. This was last week. And really, like, we, we've been redlining on this for the past month and a half specifically. But um, in the last week, we had to get uh, basically all the episodes done because our fifth episode is an epilogue episode where we're talking about everything that didn't make the final cut and kind of where are they now sort of stuff with, with our two main characters. And so we uh, set a date and we agreed for them to both come to Vegas. And so they did. Uh, but that means that they have to hear the season because they're ostensibly going to be talking about it, about, about the season. Uh, and so we had set the first three episodes to them. Uh, and then, you know, we had to rush and get the, the fourth one done. But uh, uh, they got to hear it the night before we recorded our, our epilogue. 
and it was uh, incredibly ingratiating to hear that they thought it reflected their uh, their perspective. Because the last thing you want to do after you spend this much time is is have them be like, "That isn't how it happened." That's yeah, you're 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 making a bunch of lies. They, they were positively ebullient about uh, how we landed everything. They they felt like they were represented quite well. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I, I, as an outsider, knowing you both, uh, the, the, I, I'm not, I'm not surprised that they're happy because, one, knowing one of those individuals really well, and knowing the quality of character he is, but also that you were trying to find the story, yeah. you weren't trying to create, craft a story, and that's hypothetically not that I work with people in the media a lot and every day, but often I see that very much like they know. They need me to fill in this part, but they already know where this is going to land. Regardless of what anybody says here, they're just going to cherry pick what's going to say there to get to this point where you wanted to really find out what happened and uh, talk to the people involved. Uh, uh, hypothetically speaking, <laughs> that is uh, uh, the, 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 the thing that you're talking about, Andrew, is uh, I think a, a problem in journalism that is largely editor driven and i don't mean editor when you say editor people often think of oh somebody gets a piece of paper and then they form it into a thing that's like the literal process of editing uh but an editor at let, let's say a newspaper or a magazine are the ones who assign stories and very often those people have an idea of what story they want to tell and they are giving their reporters the the uh you know, the the marching orders to do it. The best editors are the ones that are thrilled when the story turns out to be something different than what they expected. And and they give more uh, uh, open-ended things because they want to trust their reporters to to get the story and bring it back. Uh, Not so great editors, of which I think there are a lot in high positions, but uh, they they are are more rigid. What we want to do with World's Greatest Con Especially this story, and, and, and as people will hear, part of this story is that, and the reason why it's never been told the way that we're going to tell it is because no one's ever spent the amount of time with the two kids that actually did it um, in, in the kind of way that we did. And uh, uh, now they're men with you know families and legacies behind them. But uh, uh, this was something that I think we realized very, very early on, that the themes we got from both of them uh, were were how we wanted to uh, uh, underpin this story, and if anything, the stuff that we embellished. Uh, I know from my perspective, as as you know, a producer and editor on it, was to always be able to go to anything that Brian says. We need to be able, especially if it's provocative, we need to be able to back it up with one of the two saying something like that. Like if, if, if Brian's like, they desperately wanted to do this, that, and the other, it's not just Brian inventing a version of them. Right. Uh, we can cut to one of them saying, boy, do we desperately want to do that? Uh, uh, cause we didn't want to go too far. And, uh, uh, boy, the places you will go in this series, specifically the endings of our, of our second and third episodes are, uh, uh, telegenic stories that have never been told anywhere. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's terrifying because, uh, if I wish anything for anybody who's trying to tell a story, may your story be one that you don't particularly care much about because when it's a story that you care a lot about, boy, does it get more difficult. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I I tend to feel that you always want to invest yourself in the in in a in a story and in in the point of view of somebody i think that that whenever you're writing or crafting a narrative the goal is to make the audience connect to it and uh the way that you can most easily make somebody connect to something is to put them in it you know it, it's one of those things that and andrew and i have talked about this a, a, a million times and and you know i've thought so much about story structure over the past you know, especially since since starting World's Greatest Con and Raise the Dead and 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 all that, but but creating those in in audio, especially for nonfiction. But I owe so much of it to the 
hours and hours that Andrew and I spent at at Arby's and Panera Bread and and various other uh, lunch spots in South Florida, just talking about story. Just like, okay, well, let's do a Star Trek movie, but uh, uh, no technology, right? And and you know, the, what if there was a star a Star Trek Saw movie? How would we do it? What? And then you break down the beats of 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 X, Y, and Z. But one of the things that I always had a hard time wrapping my head around whenever we would have those conversations, especially in certain genre things, was the idea of wish fulfillment. That like, that's such a powerful way that you bind yourself to characters and you're trying to explain why things are popular or why things uh, catch an audience. And, and I've always, initially when I was younger, I found that as almost condescending that it's like, oh, this is a wish fulfillment story, you know? Uh, and then the more that I've spent time thinking about story and writing stories and, and doing stuff like that, it's like, no, that's it. wish fulfillment is almost a, a a a misnomer for it. It's it's connection to your life, and then wondering if you had gone a different path or remembering a great path that you did take. But it's it's all kind of encoded into your the the, the memory of your of, of of your DNA or or where you wish things had gone, and that's something with any story you want to do. The problem here is that. We're dealing with real people. We're dealing with people for whom take this story extraordinarily seriously. And uh, also who are still with us to uh, have opinions on whether or not we're getting it right. Yeah. And so that was nerve wracking by the end, but you can't let it affect you while you're doing it. You, you, you just have to, you know, I, I always remember there's a scene in in Three Kings where uh, uh, the the Iraq War movie where where Spike Jones's character is uh, uh, being ingratiated amongst the locals and they're explaining to him that and he plays this like redneck kind of character uh, uh, and they're explaining to him that he is uh, uh, surrounded by holy fire and he's just like like I like I'm gonna be fine man I'm surrounded by holy fire uh, and that's that's whatever I think creatively is like you just be true to the art, be true to it, you know, connecting to you and, and you feeling good about it. And if you do that, the quality will, will, will speak for itself as long as you are not, you know, you are not being cheap and you're not talking yourself into something, you know, you gotta, you gotta organically connect to it. And if you organically connect to it, then you're doing something right. So, I guess now begins uh, the pivot from if story is strategy, we move to tactics. And this, this is the part where we have to think in terms of practical terms. How do we reduce everything that we've done for the last six months and make it a very simple, tweetable soundbite? Well, yeah. You know, first, first we got to know when it's coming out, which we don't know right now. But uh, uh, the... The, the, the sooner now than uh, two weeks ago a, a lot happens in a week yeah i think the biggest the biggest thing is uh uh we don't know when when the ads when 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 the ad the ad train rolls into station but uh yeah in terms of marketing you know uh, uh i think you know andrew you've known about project alpha for a, a, a very long time um i I think our biggest our biggest challenge right now is trying to think about how to pitch what's exciting about it to people that have no idea about what 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 Project Alpha is because that's going to be the vast majority of our audience. I'm not worried about anybody who's heard or has some passing familiarity with the phrase of Project Alpha because they're going to listen. Like 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 this is going to be good for them. Uh, uh, I'm worried about people who, you know, aren't uh, uh, aren't hip to it. It's, I, I think that, you know, you need to figure out like the, the, the simplest sentence, the whatever describes it. And, you know, the, it's a story that reaches both for how scientific research was conducted in there. Uh, the introduction of what happens when you bring showmanship or showman into that, what the different goals are, but also touches to the CIA, you know, it, it's, yep. it's. The problem with like the men who stare at goats, besides not just being not that great of a movie, is it did had it didn't really have a point of view. It's like the people who made that movie didn't really acknowledge the fact like 
yeah, this stuff, yes, these powers don't exist. Uh, and which, which, by the way, I read that book after we finished World's Greatest Con season three, and I was really, really struck by the fact that World's Greatest Con season three ends, its big reveal occurs in February, March of 1983. The beginning of The Men Who Stare at Goats begins in the summer of 1983, which means after all of the evidence about this big reveal happens, that's when the government gets down to brass tacks and doubling down on this insane stuff. Because there was, I don't know how much you get into it, but that's when the CIA was getting big funding to do paranormal research. And Project Alpha affected that, and they had to, like, spin and be like this is not connected to us at all yeah no we that, that know, is our, our imbeciles are completely different imbeciles <laughs> that is that is that is included in our in our in our finale uh, uh a, a declassified cia communication uh, uh effectively giving talking points to anybody from the cia who's talking to congressional members saying uh like wow th th that's oh my god how dumb these idiots were on television there's nothing like the absolutely sterling stanford research institute where we're doing uh you know project grill flame eventually target project stargate which is the men who stare at goat stuff well they have to have it their way they do they have to yeah. have it your way whopper 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 yeah, uh, so uh, to cut the chase, everybody, I'll save you the time and have it to watch this, listen to this documentary episode thing that they've made, whatever you call this. Um, his powers aren't real. Go home. Yeah, oh, exactly. It. That's it. Sorry. We got it. Spoiled. They they ain't got no powers. Jeez. I saved you guys. I saved everybody out there 10 bucks. <laughs> Which Wait, you can still this? send to us at patreon.com slash You can. Yeah, you can. No, my, you can. That I, I am so... I am so excited about this because having known Randy and, yeah. and worked for him and who was involved in this, one of the people involved in this and having parts heard, heard this story from certain points of view and knowing Vanacek a bit. Uh, I don't think I ever knew Mike Edwards ever chance. Maybe I met Mike Edwards once or so, but like I remember seeing, I don't want to spoil anything here, but like I remember seeing in, in Randy's study, this cartoon caricature of Randy mm -hmm. and Mike and Steve. I'm like, what's that? Like, oh yeah, that's when they were going to do the animated TV series about this. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what? You know? And then, and then, yeah, yeah. It, it's such a big story. It it is, and and I think that that now that we're so close to having the actual product sanded down, polished off, uh, it certainly has me in a place of like, okay how confidently do we go out into the world and announce because there are actual breaking news aspects to it that have never been really explored, explored before the story itself has never been told this way before. Um, I don't know. It's a lot. What are, what are you unsure about? Um, I mean, you're going to put it out like you normally do. No, this is, I mean, the story Maybe that is it, make it right up. up the, 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 the story that is Canon. If you were to look up, Project Alpha on Wikipedia is you will get an inner James, accurate James, tell. James Randy dispatched two children to fool this lab. And what this podcast series presupposes is what maybe he didn't. Uh, and that's not the point of it, uh, but it is a part of it. Um th this is very much from the perspective of 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 the two boys and they have their own uh, uh, a way of saying it, and uh, that's who, who we give voice to. I, I don't think that it's necessarily going to be the the biggest thing that people take away, but some people might. You, you never know. I think it's going to bring a lot of context to this story for anybody who knows it. For anybody who doesn't, I think they're going to get a more exciting story than the way that it's ever been told before, because the way that it has been told before was from James Randi's perspective, and while he was certainly a part of it, and neither Mike nor Steve deny that he was a, a very big part of it. An integral uh, part of it. An integral part of it. Uh, no one's ever talked about the fact that two 18-year-old kids uh, uh, all of a sudden became local celebrities in this lab that had $4 million worth of funding uh, inflated, uh, adjusted for inflation, and... What happens when two, you know, uh, uh, nineteen-year-olds all of a sudden are lying to adults? They're doing it for righteous reasons. They're horny, like they're oh. drunk. Like there's there's an '80s buddy comedy in this story 
that no one has ever touched because it's always been this kind of higher level, uh, uh, you know, uh, sword of truth against the the villain of parapsychology. And we still get a lot of that in this series, but there's, oh, oh boy, are there some are there some boots on the ground stories that are 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 retail exciting. Here we go. Check it out. World's greatest con. Alpha oh. House. I, I mean, you know, that that was our, our second episode is really all about the two boys and how they become friends and starting off highly skeptical of each other because each of them is afraid that, like, I know I'm good, but what if this guy's not very good? Then I'm going to look like a dumbass if if this guy's not very good. So they're all like ready to cut each other's throat at the beginning. But it's, yeah. And very quickly, they realize that as a team, they can they can conquer anything. Because it's an 80s best friends movie. It's just, it's so, it's, it's it, it just kind of like wrote, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it wrote to itself. I also found out this, that if you want a theme uh, that says these two bros just became best friends in the 80s, it's the exact same thing as these two, uh, two characters just fell in love. It was an '80s love theme that I found, and I'm like, "Oh, this is perfect." This immediately says that these guys became best friends. Oh, a music cue. Yeah, music cue. Oh. Music theme. Anyway, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, coming your way March or oh. April. Okay, March or April. Let's say soon. We'll say soon. soon. It's coming. Soon. Yeah, I mean, the only like to be totally transparent, since this is where we kind of open the kimono on all this, is that. Uh, we could probably have this ready to be out sooner. The reality of it is that uh, advertisers advertisers can sell different things for Q1 versus Q2. So there might okay. be a big difference between what kind of ad buy ACAS can sell by the up to the end of March, which is Q1, and then like literally the first day of April, they might be able to sell six times the uh, the, the the ad slot. So. You heard it first, April 1st. Maybe. I mean, but we don't know. We have no idea. Uh, or it, not. Yeah. So let's or just not. say. We don't know. Soon. Let's just well, say no, the this prediction is, this is, is where, still this in the envelope. We talk about right? all the, this is where we talk about all the nitty gritty yeah. stuff. So and th that's the nitty gritty yeah, stuff. There we go. Picks. 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 Marvel Snap. It's great. <laughs> um, is that under your eyelids, Brian? Yep. A little bit. What did uh uh oh man what what was I what was I watching? We just well we watched The Last of Us. I liked The Last of Us. I thought The Last of Us I thought The Last of Us was good. Uh, I'm excited for the rest of the season. Um, I do think it it for for me I did not play the video game so seeing those elements of the of 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 gameplay theatrically. Uh, uh, portrayed. I, I, I had no frame of reference for. Uh, I could tell where I assumed things like that were happening. Uh, but I, I really found uh, uh, you know, especially the first, you know, like twenty minutes, particularly compelling. And uh, I think that the world is fascinating, and I look forward to spending more time in it. Uh, uh, and maybe characters can actually. Talk to you each know, other instead develop. of going from point A to point B. Yeah. One episode. Yeah. One episode. I'm just saying. Just, I'm, I'm looking forward to more, more world, more world things. I'll, I'll double down on The Last of Us. That's a good show. Yeah. Andrew? Andrew, you got a pick? I do have a pick, gentlemen. And oh. I... I love the phenomenon of YouTube and I, I find things there that just channels and people who really pour their heart out into something much like you guys have done with World's Greatest Con. And I've been following this one YouTuber and I've probably mentioned it before for a year or two. Um, and I think that the guy's integrity, as far as I can tell, is rock solid and his research is really good. And I'm talking about CoffeeZilla, who goes on yes. about you know, a lot of NFT scams and stuff. And he recently had came to prominence because he yeah, ripped into Crypto Zoo and did some really deep dive into that. And Logan Paul came out really hard against him with two videos accusing CoffeeZilla of everything under the sun. And then Logan Paul deleted those videos and then made an apology video. Uh, so, man, CoffeeZilla, this guy, he 
does his homework. And he's nice. doing better work than anybody out there, I think. You look at look at how the media fawned over FTX. Yeah. You look at how even to this day, you still see these stories of like, oh, did, was he just in over his head? And was da, da, da. And you're like, even now, some of the coverage of it is just frustrating because it's like how ingratiated he and his people were and the people he supported were into that community that the media just could not report on something that would have been should have been purely obvious. You, you watch those interviews back now and you're like, that's clear. So Coffeezilla has been at the forefront of this and his channel's grown. And he is a guy that if you ask me to say who is the best journalist in the business, whose initials are not JRY, um, Coffeezilla, like the, the guy's diligence, how much he cares about this, doing, he's doing investigative journalism, digging deep into a most important, one of the very important financial issues right now. And this guy should be getting you know, uh, MacArthur prizes and stuff like this, but it's, it's in a world that is just invisible to the mainstream. Uh, I think he's, he does, he does a great job. I love, uh, 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 uh I love his stuff. Uh, and I do think that crypto specifically, man, is it's just in a very, very interesting place. And I, I think that in terms of media literacy, it reminds me a lot of how dumb coverage of the internet was pre blog revolution uh uh where it's like it's not to say that crypto is good or bad or a ponzi scheme or 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 whatever right believe believe whatever you want about it but it's like literacy in this goes a long way and and uh, something beyond the the kind of junky day trader element where uh, it's just another uh, rapidly fluctuating thing that you can make money on uh, uh, you know, you mix that with fame and, and everything. I think he does. He's, he's a great, great, great resource for somebody who understands each piece of that. Nice. Yeah. Coffeezilla. Uh, I, I'm, you know, some people have in our chat have some different thoughts and I'd say like, I'd buy every, do a deep dive, go into it. I would say that this guy so far, he seems to have done his homework, you know, and, and, and everybody, there's so much money involved. There's a lot of spin on stuff like, well, it was only this and this maybe, but like, it seems to have done his research. So, mm, mm. anyhow, uh, it's been after. Ray. Hey, that's the show, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on a Friday. We did it. Yeah, uh, listen, comment that he ran out of scams to expose. Okay, I know you're writing this laughing as you say that. That the, the, the NFT and crypto world, we've run out of scams there. <laughs> like, there's, yeah. like, uh, I, I would say the latter one there. Uh, I don't know. Well, uh, uh, we we talked about um, uh, frontiers, and frontiers are the land of scams, cons, and overstatements. Uh, go, yeah, yeah, go. and traps. And uh, there's always going to be a frontier, and and right now the frontier is Bitcoin. Uh, soon the frontier will be, you know, I don't know, hydrogen mining on Mars or what have you. Well, the the problem with the crypto is there's no value right now. It is a wonderful idea to solve problems, but it's it, early internet was solving problems. But you're like, oh man, what is what is crypto solved for you in the last five years? Right. Uh, and and the, the number one problem would uh, was what if there was an inflation proof uh, economy? And of course, uh, turns out crypto is very very sensitive to U.S. dollar inflation. Yeah, yeah. Already weird. Uh, point is, just this person says that these things are obvious. People keep following for them, so I think, think there needs to be a place for somebody to say this. If, if if they were obvious, they wouldn't work. They are always obvious after the fact, but in the moment, not so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into the place to a certain mentality, but yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back. Uh, we'll actually be back. I'll be back in a couple of hours. We got marbles this evening, so make sure you join us for that. Uh, we'll be back on Monday with Cord Killers, and then Tuesday with some great night. That's yeah, uh, is it Bill Oakley on the 23rd? I think so. I believe so. Yeah, the author of uh, Space 1969 and uh, creator of uh, co-creator of Mission Hill on Adult Swim. Uh, he's a cool guy. Yep, so that's Monday evening right here on Twitch. Make sure to check us out. Until then, goodbye, everybody!